Welcome to E-Town Links, a virtual resource for area businesses working to adapt to the effects of COVID-19. My name is Matthew Fritz and I'm Associate Professor of Music at Elizabethtown College. I'm one of your co-moderators for today. Kelly Fuddy is my esteemed partner in crime. Kelly? Hi everybody, welcome back and welcome to those of you for whom this is our first session of E-Town Links. Uh, if you didn't know, we have already done nine previous episodes with various business owners and stakeholders in our community and we'd love to share them with you. You can find them on our YouTube channel and that's also where you'll be able to find today's recorded session afterwards. Um, I am the former membership manager at the Chamber of Commerce and I have come back in this interim time of world and local and everywhere crisis uh, to co-moderate these discussions. Um, they're aimed to serve our members, our non-members, anyone who's looking for a place to find hope and guidance and camaraderie in our community. We wanna light up the spirit of our town, not only to help you survive, but to innovate and thrive during this exceptional challenge. And today's topic, as I'll let Matt introduce, is one that I think all of us um, have a very vested interest in, and so I'm excited to get started. Great, thank you so much, Kelly. Today's topic will be recorded and placed online at the E-Town Chambers website, as Kelly mentioned. Uh, please consider posting a question in the Q&A link at the bottom of your screen, unless you're upside down, at which point it's gonna be that direction. Uh, the moderators will share those questions with the panelists as we go. Uh, yes, as you figured out, I'm here for the comic relief or something. At any rate, today we are fortunate to have members of the Elizabethtown Area School District's leadership team joining us. Michelle Balliette, the superintendent, Dr. Michelle Balliette, has served as the superintendent of the Elizabethtown Area School District for nine years. During her tenure as EASD superintendent, she has also been the superintendent of record for the Lancaster County Career and Technical Center. Before coming to Elizabethtown in her administrative capacity, Dr. Balliette served as the assistant to the superintendent for curriculum and instruction, K-12, for a neighboring Lower Dauphin School District. She began her career in education with the East Penn School District as an elementary teacher. During the course of her years with the East Penn, she taught various grades at the elementary level. After leaving East Penn, she served in several educational consultant roles before joining the Capital Area Intermediate Unit as a K-12 curriculum specialist. Dr. Balliet holds a doctor, doctorate degree in educational leadership and management from Drexel University, a master's degree in academic curriculum and instruction instructional leadership from Penn State University, and a Bachelor's of Science degree in Elementary Education from Kutztown University. Also joining us today, Dan Surface. He is the assistant to the superintendent. In December of 2017, the Elizabethtown Area School District Board of Education unanimously approved the hiring of Dan Surface as the assistant to the superintendent for learning. Mr. Surface began his duties as assistant to the superintendent in June 2018 at the completion of his commitment to the service of our military connected youth. Mr. Surface began his, his duties as assistant to the superintendent in June 2018. As I said, from August 2014 until September of 2016, Mr. Surface served as principal of Elizabethtown Area High School. While at Elizabethtown, his leadership and high expect expectations for student learning and growth successfully facilitated the goals of the district's comprehensive plan. Prior to rejoining Elizabethtown Area School District, Mr. Surface served as the principal of Wiesbaden Middle School in Germany, ja, sehr gut, a United States Department of Defense public school for children of our military personnel stationed overseas. Mr. Surface has also successfully served as a principal at schools in Spain and Italy and as assistant principal at Hershey High School in Derry Township, PA and Radnor High School in Wayne, PA. He has also taught civics and science and coached at William Allen High School in uh, Allentown, PA and the Shipley School in Bryn Mawr prior to transitioning into public school administration. Mr. Surface is a graduate of the United States Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland, where he earned a bachelor's degree in applied mathematics. He was awarded a master's degree in educational leadership from Lehigh University in 2005. Other postgraduate degrees include a master's in management from Troy University and a master's in public administration from Shippensburg University, which he received while studying national security affairs at the U.S. Army Senior Officer War College in Carlisle, PA. And last but not least, Richard Schwartzman. He's our Assistant Superintendent for School Student Support Services and Compliance. He was named Assistant to the Superintendent for Student Support Services and Compliance in 2016. This is the latest in a number of administrative roles Mr. Schwartzman has served 
has held since joining the Elizabethtown Area School District team in 2001. Mr. Schwartzman has been serving as assistant to the superintendent for secondary education since July 2008. He has also served as a brief, a brief stint in the central office as the director for schools and learning during the 2007-2008 school year. Mr. Schwartzman began his tenure with the district as middle school principal before being named supervising principal both of both the middle and high schools in 2004. Prior to joining the Elizabethtown Area School District, Mr. Schwartzman was the assistant principal at Eagle View Middle School in the Cumberland Valley School District. He began his career in education teaching biology, biochemistry, anatomy, and dissection at Gettysburg Area High School before becoming a middle school physical science teacher in the Cumberland Valley School District. Mr. Schwartzman holds a master's degree in education administration from Shippensburg University and a bachelor's of science degree in biology from Mount St. Mary's College. Panelists, welcome and take it away. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Kelly. Um, it's really great to be here with all of you as I'm kind of taking a look at some of the folks that are joining us as participants. Some of this may look familiar to you because they are some repeat slides that we used in our July board meeting and we have some updates for you as well. So I really do appreciate everybody taking their time. We know that this is a, as, as Kelly had alluded to, a very hot topic right now um, of reopening admit, amid uh, coronavirus concerns. So we're happy to be with you today. I wanted to let you know that we continue to work diligently as information continues to evolve and transpire. And we just look forward to sharing some information with all of you today. So thanks for having us. Um, next slide, please. So just a couple of reminders. Um, the first one is probably the most important is that this is uncharted territory for all of us. Um, when you are looking at reopening of school buildings and bringing students and faculty back to campus amid a pandemic, this is really uncharted territory. We, we're really good at the world of education, but when you couple it with um, pandemic concerns, how we piece all of those together, this is really uncharted territory for all of us. Uh, the new information continues to come out daily, not only from our uh, local level, at the state level, and also at the national level. Our health and safety plan was board approved in mid-July and was submitted to um, Pennsylvania Department of Education. It does include a multi-pronged approach to not only to try to mitigate, but also reduce transmission. I want to be really honest. I don't think there's a way that we can fully negate COVID-19 in our schools. However, our responsibility is to figure out the best way to minimize um, the impact of COVID-19. As you know that we've been in a uh, red, yellow, green uh, system here in Pennsylvania set up by our governor. Uh, yellow and green phases are still not a return to normal. I've had many conversations with uh, parents and families and they're like, I can't wait till it gets back to normal. Well, we're in the green phase right now and this is still not normal. I like to think of normal, people were thinking about February, last February timeframe. March, it was starting to get a little um, tenuous, but February, we're not in that normal stage and I'm not sure we're going to be for a long time. There are still limitations and restrictions within each of those phases whether we stay in green, or if we go back to yellow, hopefully we don't get to red, uh, back to red. But each of these phases has some restrictions and limitations directly impacting schools. And even in the green stage, and I know that uh, it's summer and people are feeling like they had been cooped up and they want um, they want to get out and do things. But even in green, large gatherings of more than 250 people are prohibited. Now, the question that we get is, well, okay, so if that's prohibited, how can schools open? There's always that little caveat in the governor's guidance saying this doesn't apply to school when it's academic purposes, but when it's 250 gathering, 250 people or more outside of academic purposes, we know that that is an effect for everyone. Next slide, please. So our health and safety plan was the plan that we had to submit to the Pennsylvania Department of Education 
first. And so that plan has been submitted. Um, it's been recognized by the Department of Education. It is on our district website um, in our EASD reopening center. And however, that's just the first piece of what we have to pay attention to. Um, we need to look at teaching and learning. What will teaching and learning look like in this health and safety plan? What will social and emotional planning look like within the confines of the health and safety plan? And what does equity and access of our students mean in, in with the health and safety plan? All four of those have to work in tandem in, in order for us to be able to successfully reopen schools. If we are not at the reopening part, if for some reason the governor puts us back in red, and we still need to pay attention to teaching and learning, social and emotional learning, and equity and access. Next slide, please. So the question always comes um, that I get is, how in the world did you develop this plan? Did all of the administrators just, just sit down and put this together? Well, no, we, we didn't. Um, we actually solicited stakeholder feedback from every one of our families in the Elizabethtown Area School District. We also um, solicited feedback from every one of our employees who are employed in the Elizabethtown Area School District. And we also involved community partners. There are several names that I see on this attendees list who were part of our stakeholder development group. Uh, we had a four hour Zoom meeting, uh, multiple squares, uh, and soliciting input from those folks to help us develop the surveys with which to gather information. Then we took the guidance and feedback um, that was sought um, from our school physician and other local health officials. And it appears my graphic over, um, went over the letter L, so apolog apologize for that. So it is school, not school um, physician, but our school physician. We also um, are in consultation with the departments of health at the, at the state level and the Department of Education. And we use DOH and PDE um, quite regularly. I know that in, in schools we use a lot of acronyms, but DOH, we're talking about Department of Health, PDE, we're talking about the Department of Education. We, and then we also applied this information to our planning um, from the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Centers for Disease Control. Next slide, please. So it was lots of information. Um, and then, you know, that we have guidance that comes from the state. And then we also have orders that come from the state. And a significant challenge of public schools is that we are required to adhere to governor's orders. And we know that not everyone agrees with all aspects of all of the orders. However, as a school district, we're obligated to follow those orders. Um, I, I will put this out there since we're all adults. You know, it, it, this has become a very polarized uh, time frame where I'm not even sure it's just a political polarization. It's, it's really become, it's, it's black or it's white. It's, there's nowhere in between. Um, unfortunately for schools, when we have, when there are governor's orders, we don't get to navigate within that. We're told this is what we're, we're going to have to do. Um, so please understand that if you're sending a child back, the masking order is a great one. Um, we have to follow the masking order. But then there's guidance that it says, well, you can operate within the confines of this. So um, again, while people may not agree with all aspects, this is what we are charged with following. The information does seem to evolve daily. Um, I will be leaving this meeting and I will be going on to a superintendent's meeting where I'm going to be getting additional updates from the um, Secretary of Education. I will have another meeting tomorrow. Uh, my two esteemed colleagues with me today, they are involved in meetings. We're constantly trying to figure out and hear from what is the latest information and then how that applies to schools. So we are staying abreast of that information both at the state and at the local level. We continue to update our school board um, on this, on these changes and the public at our board meeting. Our next board meeting is on Tuesday, August 11th, uh, that is going to be um, available for the public and that's where we'll bring any additional update and information. We've also been posting things on our reopening center on our district website 
in addition to using our school messenger of direct messaging out to our families, whether it's via phone calls, texts, um, and, and then posting on our social media. Next slide, please. So here's what we seem to know. In order to keep schools open and operational, and since this is a chamber meeting, also to keep businesses operational, it's gonna to need to be a collective effort from everyone to help stop the spread of this virus. Schools aren't going to be able to do this by themselves. Businesses aren't gonna be able to do these by themselves. It's gonna take a collective effort of everyone to be able to keep our schools open and keep our businesses open. In schools, we are going to have to put in additional safety measures because physical, or we'd like to, um, I know everybody's calling it social distancing, we like to call it physical distancing. At all times, it's just not possible and it's not realistic in a school setting. Um, if you, many of you have children, you have kids who play together, um, it's really hard to keep people separated. We're gonna do the best we can to adhere within the, um, those gui that guidance. However, we know that um, we're going to have to have some additional safety measures put in place. The most effective safety measure is continued hand washing and proper hygiene. That's really an effective way to stop the spread of any disease, but that will be a major component of our health and safety plan. Next slide, please. We'd also know that what happened in the spring, students miss vital in instruction from a consistent curriculum. So spring, what, everyone was thrown into this scenario. We had, um, everyone had challenges. We had challenges as schools, we had challenges as educators, families had challenges, everyone had challenges. What we learned from that is, and at the federal level, at the state level, that Students need to be connected with their teachers. We learned from our survey results that um, children need to be connected with their peers. And so we are really looking at all of that data and saying, how do we make sure that we are ensuring the board approved Elizabethtown Area School District curriculum and making sure that that's provided on a consistent basis. We do know that there was anxiety and depression, um, not only in adults, but also in students resulting from that isolation. But the biggest thing we know is that schools and activities, whether those are extracurricular, athletics, um, they're gonna have to operate differently this fall. Next slide, please. So we do have um, some options to reopen in the fall, and this is underway right now. We still have, as we sit here today, every intent to open with an in-person instruction at Elizabethtown Area School District. Okay? That is um, based upon the guidance of the Centers for Disease Control, the American Academy of Pediatrics, our strong stakeholder feedback that uh, wanted in-person instruction and alignment with the Pennsylvania Department of Education and the research studies that they commissioned. However, we also understand that this in-person option may not be appropriate for all families or match up with families' desires. So we're also providing a new EASD online option. And that on online option addresses what I just said about a consistent curriculum. Um, it will be enhanced it's going to be a robust curriculum. There's going to be student accountability, teacher accountability. It is going to be graded. It's going to be teacher facilitated and direct contact with families, um, with students. Now this option requires pre-registration by July 31st. And the reason being is because we have to look at our phenomenal teaching staff and how we redeploy in order to meet those needs. Just like families are, are asking, are there medical reasons too that uh, your child cannot wear masks? Because that's the only reason that a child cannot wear a mask is for a medical reason that they cannot do that. We're also asking our teachers, are there medical reasons why they cannot be back in the classroom? And we're trying to match up all of those needs. So that's why we have that date 
of July 31st because there's still a lot of work to assign students to classes and teachers and making sure that we can provide the best educational experience for students here in the Elizabethtown Area School District. And then we also have our third option. We've had this third option for over 10 years now. It, it's called LLVS, Lancaster Lebanon Virtual Solutions. It is our school district, um, but it is an asynchronous, which means it's not in real time. Students um, pace themselves through that. There are some um, touch points with educators, but they're more, it's much more independent, and we continue to have that option as well. Next slide, please. So um, I know that Kelly's been kind enough. She's been posting where the reopening center is on our website. If you, if you get to that um, reopening center, you're gonna see some, some information there. I have the link also um, on this slide, but there's information about face coverings. We have always wanted our students to wear face coverings. However, at that July board meeting, there was not an ability to enforce the use of face coverings. And then um, two weeks ago now, the governor has given us um, much more oomph with enforcing face coverings. So unless students have a medical condition and they must go through a 504 process, and that's all on our website, we are requiring students and staff to wear face coverings. So that, that information is up there. We also use our school messenger site to get that information out. Um, there's information on special education services. We have a, a great graphic, um, a closer look at each option that's on there. We'll talk about that in a little bit. We have our board approved health and safety plan, frequently asked questions, um, this whole presentation that we did with our school board is up there, and then our parent and guardian survey results. So you can see for yourself how our parents and guardians responded to that survey. Next slide, please. At this point, I'd like to turn this over um, to Mr. Dan Surface, our assistant superintendent, and he's going to talk about the three options um, that I just spoke of, um, parent choice. So, Mr. Surface? Thank you, Dr. Balliot. Yes, in addition to the uh, guidance we received from the state level, uh, our survey results clearly indicated that uh, the majority of parents chose to have their students back in the building. So that's certainly one of our, our, <clears throat> our offerings, and that's the traditional in-person model with um, EASD teachers. The second option, the EASD online option, um, is also with EASD teachers, and I'll get into that a little bit more. And then the third being the Lancaster Lebanon Virtual Solutions, which we uh, contract with through our intermediate unit, that is IU13. That is That uh, offering is independent of school hours. It's with state certified teachers, but not, not EASD teachers. It's, uh, it's largely independent work. Um, there is some contact time during the um the week with assigned teachers but again largely independent courses are assigned through the intermediate unit but we administratively oversee that um, we have put a lot of time this summer into planning uh really uh academic e efficacy and equity and social emotional wellness really are driving our planning uh, particularly for the first two models but in all three of those models those students are are still school district students and still have um, participation ability for um, all of our extracurriculars and 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 other offerings that that we uh, that we'll be able to provide in this um, pandemic environment. But for the in person and the EASD online, they those students would follow the same schedule. Um, we have specific online teachers that will be assigned to the to the students and cohorts. Uh, they'll both be following the same curriculum, scope and sequence and pacing guides. Uh, again, the same school hours, same content. Um, there will be collaboration um, involvement in both in-person and EASD online, which is a virtual environment. Um, there will be grading 
So we've really stepped up what we did in the spring. Again, um, we did pivot well, I thought, on March 13th, um, but we all know that um, we really needed to increase efficacy and, and student learning and engagement. So attendance will be taken for the online model uh, on a routine basis through the day, as will, of course, the in-person. Uh, grading will be now uh, involved with the EASD online where it was pass and incomplete for the spring. Um, both, uh, of course, the EASD online and of course the in-person are both synchronous, uh, where the student will be um, involved with the teacher through the school day in the online version. Um, one of the frequent questions we get, will my child be sitting in front of the computer all day in the EASD online? The answer to that is, is no. Of course, there's phys ed class breaks, recess breaks, lunch breaks, independent work breaks. So, um, and that'll be variable somewhat by teacher, but it won't be continuously at the monitor all day. Um, we'll be using our learning management system for um, both in-person and EASD online that we've been developing over the years, Schoology, for grades four through 12 and Seesaw, which was proven very successful, uh, very successfully piloted at East High this past year. That will be consistent K to three. And we'll be providing parent tutorials to, uh, to help parents through that uh, learning management system. We've um, worked with vendors to in increase our technology instruction tools and, uh, and, and lastly, we see the transition between in-person and online to be fairly um, fluid, um, but we're asking parents to commit at least through September for whether it's in-person or online so we can uh, create this, you know, share the resources, redistribute the resources that particularly teachers, as Dr. Valiat stated, um, uh, to get started. Um, we do have extensive Q&A uh, for these issues online. We also have the in, in, informative uh, four column, what we're calling a four column document that's online comparing and contrasting the options. And we've been receiving a lot of questions and answering questions from parents, uh, both principals, um, district office administration throughout the last couple of weeks. And we'll continue to do that through this week so parents can make the most informed decision possible. Thank you. Next slide, please. That's Mr. Schwarzman. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for, um, for having us um, today. Um, I'm not going to talk specifically about each word that's on the slide. I'm going to give some updates with regard to the next couple slides. As Dr. Bally had alluded um, at the beginning of the presentation, our goal is to help mitigate the occurrence of COVID spread. Um, one of the ways that we see this being possible within the school setting is creating some consistency related specifically to symptom screenings. So our goal is that parents and or guardians will conduct these screenings um, with their students each morning before they send them off to school, whether that's um, the, our school transportation or whether or not they're um, walkers or whether or not parents are dropping um, their student off directly at the school. Um, we're, we're expecting the same thing for our employees. Our employees will perform self-screening as well on themselves each morning prior to leaving for work. The, we also are going to be asking for a family commitment and declaration form to be completed by families as well as the employees. Again, it's a gentle reminder um, prior to leaving for work and or leaving for school each day that if I'm not feeling well, the general takeaway is stay home. Um, and again, there, then there's some additional caveats to that, but we all know um, everyone on this call, I'm sure, has had those days where you weren't feeling necessarily 100% and you sort of pushed through and you went to work. And as Dr. Balliet said, we sort of have not returned to normalcy at this particular point in time, so really not knowing whether or not the symptoms that you may be experiencing are directly related to COVID 
We're hoping that folks err on the side of caution. And that's really what those declarations um, are all about. Next slide, please. One of the things that came up um, with VAR surveys as well as from the um, guidance initially that was coming out was how would um, screenings take place? Would you do them at home with parents or would you be screening at schools um, upon arrival? Based on the number of students and staff that we have, we've opted to do the self-screen at home prior to leaving um, for school for the day, whether in the capacity of a student or as an employee. So temperature screenings will not be required upon once students arrive at school. Again, the general takeaway is that if you've been, um, if you know you've been exposed to COVID-19, you've been directly diagnosed, um, or in general just aren't feeling well, our hope is that you will stay home um, and let the process sort of run its course. Next slide, please. One of the things that we had to build into our um, health and safety plan, as Dr. Valley alluded to, that was approved a few weeks ago, we had to spend a lot of time identifying what we were going to classify as the symptoms, which that was easy, that all came from all the health entities that are out there and the experts from the CDC, et cetera. So those signs are identified here. We also had to make um, modifications and adaptations within our own operational protocols pertaining to how we would isolate potential persons of interest who may be exposed to or may be experiencing or showing signs and symptoms of COVID as well as then what would the quarantine expectations be for students, staff, visitors potentially to the building um, and how that would all translate within our plan. So we're actually in the process now of identifying where our isolation spaces are going to be in each of the buildings. That had to be a requirement as part of our plan. So in addition to our normal health suites that exist in each building, each building has also had to identify an isolation room which will help facilitate that if it becomes apparent that there may be a situation that a um, stakeholder has um, come down with COVID, we have a spot that we can isolate, go through the appropriate um, processes with our health services staff, make sure that they're appropriately dressed within all their PPE gear, um, and then work um, very efficiently with families to be able to get either that employee and or student um, removed from um, our facilities and get them home so the treatment um, and quarantine can actually begin. Next slide, please. I'm going to deal with this one too, if that's okay, Dr. Balliet. Please. Okay. So the one of the things that we, within the plan also, that we have to create is a communication plan. We're in the process of that as we're fine tuning all of our protocols now that the plan has been approved. One of the things that keeps coming up quite a bit is, well, how would I be notified if my child or my spouse, et cetera, was in a location where there may have been um, a possible exposure. How, what's gonna be communicated with regard to that? We will actually work directly with the Department of Health. They will actually guide us through that process. Um, we do have to maintain privacy as to the greatest extent as possible. Um, the Department of Health will actually help us um, go through the contact tracing process um, if it becomes apparent that we have a case of COVID. And then based on that, they will then guide us in terms of who do we actually need to make direct contact with. So this is a little bit different than some other things. Um, under Dr. Balliet's leadership, we have been very transparent as issues rise within any of our buildings. And this one's going to be slightly different in terms of who we will actually be able to communicate with in terms of possible exposure as we move forward. This is constantly developing, and I know as Dr. Valley has alluded to earlier, she has a meeting after this. Um, I know Lancaster um, in general has been working very diligently with Lancaster General Health in terms of being able to develop sort of an operational tree in terms of how we will proceed if in fact we believe we have a um, identified case moving forward. Next slide. Thanks, Mr. Schwarzman. Um, I think one of the hardest things is we're in an instantaneous information society and everybody wants information yesterday uh, to, to make decisions on. And so this one is we have to walk side by side um, with, our, with our health uh, care professionals. We have a school physician um, that we work most closely with. We also are working with partners at Lancaster General Hospital and uh, some of the county commissioners there. 
And then what I wasn't aware of is if somebody goes for a COVID test, that automatically gets reported to the Department of Health at the state level. And so um, while everyone wants in information instantaneously, there may not be information that we are able to provide yet. And um, I, I just wanna caution families because I know that people are worried about their, um, their children. Uh, we worry about the children, we worry about the staff. We do have to be very careful about privacy laws and concerns and making sure that we're sharing factual information and not rumor. Um, we've all seen the experience of the Facebook rumors that get started out there, the social media rumors, and we cannot be um, sharing information that we are unable to share or that don't have at the time. We will do our very best um, to try to uh, stop rumors, but we would really ask for the help of the community not to start rumors either, because again, this is something that we have to work side by side with health officials on. So I did talk about um, physical and social distancing. We are going to do that to the maximum extent possible um, in all learning spaces. There is still a debate between three feet and six feet going on right now. Um, if you talk to some of the medical professionals, they're saying three feet with masking is perfectly suffice. If you talk to other people, it's six feet, no mask. We are going to try to adhere to six. When we can't adhere to six, we're gonna to adhere to three. Um, and again, we are having the masking um, involved in there. So, uh, and, and we call it face coverings because there's also times where the face shields will be used, clear face shields in working with students who maybe need to read lips or um, understand speech formation. So we are, so, well, I'm saying masking, it's really face coverings um, in order to help mitigate that. We have asked our staff to remove personal furniture, which is a, a departure from where we were going with the soft seating and the comfortable spaces, where we're trying to remove extraneous furniture out of our buildings uh, so that we provide as much space as possible in each of our learning areas to adhere to the physical distancing. Um, so the big takeaway on this is that everyone should have face coverings with them at all times when in our buildings and even off of our, off of our property. Next slide, please. We are still going to be providing um, district transportation. However, we're going to be doing it under these conditions. Um, face coverings are going to be required of all passengers to use our, to use our buses. We, we're going to um, seat members of the same household together. Um, and people might go, well, that's a no brainer. But there are times we get requests from parents saying, hey, you know, they have to spend the, you know, family time together. We'd like them to have their own friends on the bus. Well, we're going to actually put family members in the same household um, in the same, same seat. We are going to assign two students to a seat and they are not, it's not going to be every other seat. It is going to be every seat. And uh, we are going to have cleaning happen on both the ends of the morning and afternoon runs. We're trying to work out, can we have more than one uh, morning run at a different, at a separate level? Because we have morning runs for secondary and morning runs for elementary. And then we have afternoon runs for secondary, afternoon runs for elementary we're looking at transportation now as we're gathering that information about what option parents are choosing for their for their children to determine can we get multiple bus runs in the morning for elementary can we get multiple bus runs in the morning for secondary can we get multiple bus runs in the afternoon for secondary can we get multiple bus runs in the afternoon for um, elementary and so we're working through that process right now Having said that, everyone online, just know that everyone likes their information the beginning of August. You're probably not going to get schedules and bus runs until uh, mid-August to maybe the third week in August because there's still so much legwork to do by providing the, the choices and options for our families. Uh, the one takeaway is that families actually may choose to transport their own child instead of 
setting them on the bus. Where our community can help us is if you live in a development where the children are already playing together and you're choosing, and there's multiple of you who are choosing not to send your children to school on the bus, maybe you could coordinate carpools if they're already playing together anyway, so that we wouldn't have one child per per um, car coming because you know we do hear that in Elizabethtown the traffic is terrible well the traffic is terrible at the arrival of school and the dismissal of school so one of the things that we could actually help with is if you are if you are already having your children play with other children in the neighborhood maybe you could coordinate um, those carpooling if you're choosing not to use district transportation next slide please so cleaning and sanitizing, um, our, all of our high touch areas are gonna be cleaned regularly um, throughout our school. And we, we list what those are right there. We are encouraging um, students and staff to bring on their own individual water bottles. Somebody said, well, just turn off the water fountains. Well, by law and by code, you're not allowed to just turn off fountains. Um, but we are encouraging folks to bring their own um, water bottles. We do have water filling stations, water bottle filling stations. Um, in, in some of our buildings that can be utilized, just understand that we're gonna be having those cleaned quite regularly. Our practice has been to have our classroom doors closed and our doors closed within our building. Um, inside, we're going to keep those open to also minimize the opening and closing of doors. We are going to um, ask uh, folks to either sanitize or wash their hands on a frequent basis. Next slide, please. Uh, we are going to have hand sanitizers in every single classroom that doesn't already have a sink and with soap and paper towels. And then we're also going to be having um, hand sanitizing stations in hallways and common areas. Next slide, please. So there's lots of planning that goes on to this. We're going to have to um, look at schedules and teacher assignments for some of these safety procedures. We may have um, cases where to keep cohorts of students together, the students will stay in the classroom and the teacher is the one who is moving from class to class. We are going to be controlling um, traffic flow within our buildings, try to pro um, provide one way hallways so that we're not mixing um, two directional. We do not have really wide hallways in Elizabethtown and some of our older buildings. So we're trying to minimize the traffic flow. In our cafeterias, we're going to be trying to stagger um, seating arrangements and extend lunch, um, lunch serving times as much as possible uh, to, to accommodate our students and also use our outdoor spaces. You know, I've visited schools in other parts of the country and, you know, people sit outside on, on a beach towel and, and have a little picnic lunch. And we're going to try to utilize as much outdoor space as we can, um, weather permitting. And we're also going to um, structure our arrival and dismissal um, procedures to limit large gatherings. So for folks who like to come to school in the morning and kind of hang out and chit chat, we're not gonna be able to do that in the morning. Um, we're gonna have to minimize those, those large gatherings for both our students, our staff, and our visitors. Next slide, please. We're not going to be sharing materials. Uh, we're going to be trying to minimize that at, at all costs of sharing materials. We are going to be utilizing electronic resources because we have um, more of a one-to-one -one environment in grades four through 12 to the fullest extent. We're going to be suspending cubby and locker use across the district. Uh, we may be able to reinstitute that in some buildings and in some classrooms once we get up and running, but we're going to suspend, uh, suspend those uses because that also creates some large gathering um, pinch points for us as well. Phys Ed is going to be held outside as much as possible. We may need to alter it if weather does not permit us to be outside. Our, our elementary students are still going to be having recess, but we're also going to incorporate a cool down um, process because if you've ever seen a group of um, hot, sweaty children coming back in from recess and heavy breathing, you know, we want to be able to minimize that as well. Next slide, please. We are going to be um, significantly limiting visitors and volunteers and the public into our, into our buildings. This is really 
in order to help stop the spread of the virus. We've got lots of students who um, are forgetful of materials uh, and parents are dropping off materials all day long. I forgot my notebook, I forgot my book, I forgot my instrument, I forgot my, my equipment, whatever that might be. Um, we understand that. We're dealing with children. Um, I, as a grown adult, I forget things <laughs> a lot of times, but we're going to, instead of having all of that traffic in and out, um, student materials are gonna be dropped off in school vestibules and they're not gonna be brought right into the office and then somebody will go out and, and get those things and then disperse those um, appropriately. So we are, um, there are going to be new uh, vetting systems coming in. And this is really to protect our students and our staff. Um, volunteers, we're gonna hold off on that as much as possible so that we can make sure that we can maintain the safety of our students and staff. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, folks who have questions, they never know who to direct their question to. We have set up a specific E-Town um, email address. It's the reopening at etownpaschools.org. If you don't have, if you, if it's a counseling question, it should go to the school counselor. If it's a building level question, it should go to the building principal. But if you're not sure after that, we've set up um, a, an email address that, that, that gets monitored at all times. And then those questions get dispersed appropriately so that we can effectively answer folks questions. Now, um, I just got the time check. And so I want to make sure that um, we do leave time for questions. And I think that is our next slide for questions. So Matt and Kelly, I'm not quite sure how you want to do this. If you want to ask us and we'll try to answer those best we can. Yep, I'm ready. So yeah, we do have about 12 minutes until one. Um, if any of you can stay longer, great. If not, we wrap up. I'm going to try to send you the, the ones that can answered, be answered very quickly first. Um, thank you for all your hard work to open safely. Will the August 11th school board meeting be held in person or virtually? So that's a great question. Um, so this is where the governor's guidance is really interesting. Um, a school board meeting is not an academic meeting according to the state. And so you can't have any more than 25 people. Um, our school board, our executive committee is discussing that and right now the direction is to lean that to an in-person meeting um, for board but everyone else would be remote and we would be able to live stream that so we have to we have to be under the 25 number from the state so we're still working through the details so yes some of us will be in person but it won't be a full-blown um, open meeting because we have to adhere to 25 indoors okay thank you you're welcome. On the lunch question, somebody wanted to know where, it sounds like the kids are gonna be eating in the cafeteria, just spaced out. But two other people had the question, will the school still be offering the buffet style lunch? No, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, so that's where we're working with our um, SFE, our uh, food service partner. We do contract out with that and they are working on kind of grab and go type uh, things so that we can provide it in a safe environment. You know, as you know, many of the buffet style restaurants have shut down um, just because of limiting that, that contact. So um, yes, we will be providing breakfast. We still will be providing lunch, but it will look different um, at least for the first couple of months uh, as we work through, through this uh, process. They did say they'd be added a, a hot, hot option to that. Thank you, Mr. Surface. A question about the school day format in the second option, which I think would be the online option is what they're talking about. Um, will the students still attend homeroom? So we're modifying homeroom for both the uh, in-person and online. So the first class of the day will be homeroom and that's where attendance will be taking. That reduces hallway transitioning and, uh, and the possibility of transmission. Great. Will the school still be offering chorus and band to the students? National Federation of High School uh, Activities and, uh, and the National Association of Music Educators has come out with guidance on, on how we can offer that. So we're look, our music teachers are looking very closely at it 
I would say yes, I would say it would be in a modified version, but we are in the process of buying kits. I know for K to six so far, the music teachers have purchased, purchased individual kits per student to continue with music classes at those grade levels. And we're looking at it obviously at the secondary level to how this can look. This one might be a good one for Mr. Schwartzman. What, um, will there be more guidance counselors uh, to help support the students struggling with COVID-19 related issues? Great question. Um, we are not increasing per se our number of counselors um, K-12. We are um, partnering, however, um, with several entities for a trauma facilitator for K-6, as we had last year. Um, we had piloted that program. We, and we are also um, partnering with ECHOs on a crisis counselor for the year to help alleviate some of the other stresses that are on our counselors to be available to meet directly with kids. And then if they need to move them beyond what, what their job scope and se of sequence is, we can do that. Okay. Um, will the kids need to be wearing masks at recess? So if they can maintain the, the physical distancing of uh, six feet outdoors, then yes. If not, then they must wear their masks. Um, two questions about sports. Um, for sports right now, we as parents have to sign a paper saying child doesn't have a fever, cough, et cetera. Will that be needed daily to enter school as well? I think that would be a no, is that right? That's actually something, so for sports or for all students in general? I think they're asking both. Okay, so for right now, um, we are still in preseason voluntary practices. The official sports season doesn't start till um, mid-August for that. And again, I have a big meeting next week to hear from um, at least the, the Lancaster Lebanon League uh, for Board of Control and finding out what PIAA is thinking there. We are going to ask all families to do those symptom checks prior to the start of school. We're still working on whether or not families would have to do some sort of electronic sign off. Um, sports right now, it's, it's on such a small basis. It's not the over 3,900 students we currently have in the district. So we're still working through that process and finding out um, what's the best way to do that. Okay. Um, and then on sports too, how are sports practice and games overseen or managed? Like, I guess who's supervising those practices at sports? So we do have a wonderful athletic director, uh, Mr. Bill Templin, who has been working side by side with the coaches. Um, and so there are some things that have been allowed this year that aren't typically allowed to happen um, through PIAA. But those, all of those coaches work directly with Mr. Templin. They've all had um, training in symptoms and understanding and, and how this current like voluntary system is working. And then there's additional training that has to happen for the start of the sports season. I will be honest though, as I watch what's happening at the national level and at the collegiate level, um, I'm not quite sure what will happen. That is not an official superintendent. Like I'm not telling you what the decision is yet because there's still several weeks away. But as I watch what happens at the, again, national and the collegiate level, this is a very interesting time for high school athletics. Okay. Um, we have a few questions about the online learning option. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we heard early on that there's going to be an enhanced and a robust program that's different than this past spring. Um, what are you doing to enhance the online learning through the district? How are the teachers being trained? So we've, this has been a continuous effort since, really since March 13th. Certainly uh, at the end of uh, the school year, once students finished up and we, and teachers were still working, our whole professional development for those days was all centered around online learning, leveraging the learning management system. We've uh, looked at and purchased um, additional instructional technology for the teacher's use. 
Um, and the professional development continues this summer through webinars, uh, online training, and then we'll continue into August before students return. So this has been the focus of our work with teachers. Absolutely. Because teachers are on their summer vacation, right? <laughs> yes, but, but, uh, <laughs> but oh, that's a but, misnomer. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. I think all of us who know a teacher know that. Um, that, that also was a question of, I assume that, I think you also said that you surveyed all of your teachers and your staff. Um, what were the percentage of them that wanted in person versus online? Sure. So we, we did an entire employee survey, um, not only of our professional staff, but our administrative staff and our support staff. And over 55% um, wanted to go back in person. There was another 30% that would have preferred to go um, on a hybrid option of in-person and online, a combination. Um, that's not what our families wanted of the in-person online. The one thing that uh, we're really fortunate of is we've been working hand in hand with our association leadership, our union leadership, the president and vice president. And we've been, we've been actually meeting weekly uh, through almost since March, uh, you know, that next week. So March 13th, that Friday, we shut down starting the following week. And we've been working um, side by side with them and constant communication. And so while we understand that there's a lot of anxiety, um, not only from families and possibly students and also our teachers, we have some of the same options for our teachers that we do with our families and looking at medical needs and then looking at requests and trying to pair that up. So I'm really proud of the relationship that we have with our association and working, working through side by side. I will say that as we watch what's happening again at the um, national level and at the local level and then monitoring our own um, situation in our, in our county, we all have to be prepared to be flexible, to be able to pivot um, quickly because if people are not going to adhere to the guidelines right now when school's not in session, so we need everybody to kind of practice and be great role models for what we're going to be expecting in school, we may have to pivot um, and, and go to a completely online. That was not the strong preference of our parents. Uh, we know that that is not always conducive for working families to be able to do that. And while schools should not be served as a babysitting service. We know that that also allows parents though to be able to work because it provides, it provides that option for them to be able to do that. But we're really gonna need the community's help and support to be positive role models for the masking requirements, to follow the proper hand washing so that we can provide that in-person option. Because what we, we do know is that there were many of our students who were underserved through no fault of anyone's, but because they didn't have the, the same access that they have in an in-person setting. So to help our, um, all of our staff feel safe and secure, we all need to be able to follow um, some of this, some of these guidance of this guideline. A question, um, as it stands today, how many families in the district have already opted out of in-person education? If you can't update us today, can we get an update next week? Sure, we're gonna, we're gonna actually be giving that update um, at the board meeting um, that we have in August. We're still collecting that, you know, that information. I will say that the three options that we provide, that we're providing um, for our families, those are already within the school district's budget, okay? We're reallocating dollars. When people choose to go to outside cyber, right now there's this misnomer that money follows the child. Well, there's some things that outside cybers do not have to pay for that school districts do. And so those, that's an additional anywhere between twelve to $21,000 out of our school district allocated budget. So if folks are choosing those outside cybers, which they have a choice to do, um, just know that those are additional costs that are going to be um, on the school district budget, which means we, we, we're not allowed to overspend our budget. So we're going to have to remove those costs from, from other places. So yes, but we'll certainly be updating um, that at the board meeting for how many are choosing the um, 
the online options that the district is offering. Okay. I'm hoping you guys can hang in. I have about three or four more questions. Are you okay I, with that? Yep. I can give you about five more minutes and then I need to jump onto the superintendent. I know Mr. Surface has the same um, situation. All right. I'll hold myself to it. Um, two quick questions about cleaning. Um, who will be cleaning the classrooms and how often? And also about the bus. I think it was about the Oh no, we already about the bus cleaning, but I think you hit on that. Yep. So the cleaning is actually going to be, we, we have our buildings and ground staff who's, who's been doing an amazing job this summer, um, getting things ready. There, it's, all, it's going to be a combination of our buildings and ground staff and then some individual choices. Like if you're using something, you're gonna be responsible for cleaning. Teachers, if they are assigned to one classroom, we might have students, you know, use um, wipes and clean off their area. So we're working through all of those protocols because there's some materials that only buildings and grounds and you have to go through extensive training on that of how to use those materials versus if you're just wiping down with a, a hand wipe. So it is going to be a combination, but we're going to ask everybody to take responsibility for cleaning their areas. Um, some guidelines about CTC students. Um, will CTC be sending anything out to the parents of students attending? So they, they absolutely should be. Um, that's coming out from Dr. Stuart Sabin um, from the Career and Technology Center. They also have every intention of providing in-person instruction because we know so much of career and technology education is hands-on. And um, that information should be coming out over the next um, couple of weeks for them as well before the start of school. I know that people are getting anxious because it's the end of July, but the reality is there's still a lot of work to do and school doesn't start till that last week in August um, for, our, for our students. So folks have got to please give us grace, um, understand that we all need to be flexible because we're all trying to chart this new territory and we're going to continue to work as quickly as possible to uh, make sure that we can reopen to students and staff responsibly um, when that time comes. Excellent. Um, bus drivers, will they be screening themselves? Yes. Okay. Um, some people are asking about, you know, when they'll be getting schedules. I assume all of that, you know, is still up in the air about yeah, schedules. So, oh, I'm sorry, Kelly. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yes, because we need these next two weeks after we get all of the parents' um, preferences for which mode they want their child to be in, then we have to align schedules. So folks shouldn't expect schedules or bus schedules till like the third week in August this year. We know that that's late, but that's really the time that it's going to need to take us to get that all alignment because there's a lot of moving parts. So in order to provide choices and options, it does delay our opportunity to provide that information in a more typical time frame than that we that we would have in a quote normal if there's anything normal anymore. Okay, thank you so much, all of you. There's a few questions we didn't get to, but I tried to leave those being the ones that might be easy answers for people to send to that reopening um, email address. So if we didn't get to your question, please send it there. Um, and there are just some that are still those things that are up in the air that we don't know. A lot of questions about what happens with quarantine or confirmed positives. And it sounds like you're working with the doctors, uh, the school physician and the DOH on that, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, everyone. I know Mr. Surface and I are going to bounce off because we have other meetings and I know so does Mr. Schwarzman. So thank you. Thank you for having us. And again, we look forward to doing this together. So thank you. Thank you. So thank much. you all so very much. Thank you so much for our wonderful panelists and for everybody joining us. Uh, we're all in this together, everybody. So let's uh, join hands. Well, no, not join hands. Uh, virtually join hands and uh, let's let's take care of uh, take care of one another take care of our community we know how important it is uh, for us to step up and and uh, and conquer this together thank you again so much for joining us today if you didn't have uh, and your question answered we do remind you to visit the the e-town schools website for a great resource and lots of information as well as uh, direct questions that can be posed there kelly can you tell us a little bit about the next coming weeks
Yeah, so in a great uh, follow up to this, we're going to have a session coming up on August 12th that will include all three of our uh, state legislators that cover our school district. So it will be Senator Ryan Almond, Representative Dave Hickernell, and Representative Mindy Fee. Um, there is a possibility that date could have to shift because they may end up being in session that day. So we'll keep you updated, but put it on your calendar for now. Um, lots of questions we can ask them about um, legislative solutions and priorities that are coming up to help deal with COVID-19 from a business perspective, from an education perspective. Um, so we look forward to that and to seeing you there. Follow us on the Chamber or Discover Elizabethtown uh, to continue knowing what's happening with the Chamber. Um, we're so thankful for all of you and for our local businesses. If you can think of any ways that your business or your organization might be able to support families in our community for whom this school year is truly going to be a struggle um, to help their kids stay well educated, please let us know what creative ideas um, that you're thinking of because to keep our workforce and our economy going, um, we're putting a lot of pressure on our schools um, to make that happen for us, especially those of us who are parents um, who need to work. So let's see what we can do um, to help the school um, carry that burden of helping our economy stay strong. Thank you so much, Kelly. Thank you, everybody, and we'll uh, see you next time.